Good morning and welcome to COVID Catechism number five. My name is Father Ryan Humphreys. I'm part of the Catholic Underground, and we're talking today about 10 dates that every Catholic should know. Now, full disclosure, I, I don't want anyone to think I'm, I'm cheating here. I'm using as my outline this outstanding book by author Diane Moxer. It's an incredibly good book, and she has a wonderful eye for the role of history uh, in, in the, the development of the Catholic Church and the role of major events. I'm not stealing most of her ideas, but I am stealing most of her outline uh, because she has several books like this, and this one is, is outstanding. And that's called 10 Dates Every Catholic Should Know by uh, Dr. Diane Moxer. Now, the reason I care about this topic and the reason that you should care about this topic right up front goes back to something that I kind of figured out and determined when I was running a Catholic high school in Natchitoches, Louisiana, St. Mary's Catholic, uh, uh, St. Mary's School in Natchitoches, Louisiana. I would begin every year by explaining to the teachers and talking to the teachers about the importance of their subject. Now, it, it bothers me that our world today is so obsessed, our educational world is so obsessed with skills. All we talk about is the test and skills. And it's this kind of practicalism that leaves us to say that what really matters is making sure that a kid leaves high school with as many skills as possible. But that's ridiculous because it, we, don't, we don't learn math because as adults, we're gonna be using an awful lot, of, we're gonna be spending a lot of our time figuring out the area of triangles in our lives. We, you know, most of us, when we finish algebra, are never going to use the FOIL method to expand a binomial. Not ever again, praise be to God. We don't learn most of the things we learn in primary and, and secondary education for their own sake. We learn those skills because they contribute to a larger understanding of thought, a larger understanding of the way that we see the world, a worldview. Math isn't about learning a bunch of skills. The surface area of a sphere, four-thirds pi r cubed, super exciting, utterly useless. And nobody needs to know that formula for its own sake. But when we go to math, we learn logic. We learn reasoning. We learn how to understand things in relation to one another. We don't learn history and literature just so that we can remember certain dates. Unless you go on Jeopardy, the dates 1215, 1066, 1488, 1588 rather, they're not gonna be dates that you just use on a regular basis. But Understanding the role the Magna Carta played in history, understanding the Battle of Hastings and the effect that had on our own history as Americans, understanding the fall of the Spanish Armada and the change in the way that Christendom worked, those are things worth knowing, not in and of themselves, but because they contribute to an understanding of human nature, an understanding of Western world history, an understanding of the way that we think about the world and the way that we perceive the world. And when we don't have these things, when we don't think about history in terms of the way that people thought or the way that people understood the world around them, then we can spout off all the numbers and dates and names that we want without ever understanding why we are the way that we are. I mean, it wasn't until I spent real time in philosophy classes thinking about modern philosophy that I realized that the Enlightenment wasn't an Enlightenment at all. It was a self-delusion, but it's something that because all we think about is what years did the Enlightenment take place, who are the names that are important with it, and how can I pass the test, that we lose touch with what we're actually trying to understand, which is how we got here. And so today's lesson is not just a lesson, and here's a bunch of dates that you should memorize uh, you know, and, and, and put them on, a, on your wall and put them on a poster board so that you know them. This isn't trivia. This is about understanding how we got where we are, understanding those moments that change the way that we ourselves thought about ourselves. And some of them are interesting in that they provide context and understanding. Others of them are interesting because they are just essentially misunderstood in history. And I'm not going to spend the next five or six hours going through this. We're going to go through them pretty quickly. These are 10 dates that we as Catholics should know 
not because we've memorized the exact number of the year, but because we need to understand how it is that we got where we are. And so the first one of these dates I want us to think about is when were the Gospels written? You know, let's think about the New Testament, right? Jesus is born right there around 0 AD, you know, right there around that time, maybe a year or two earlier, maybe a year or two later. He dies somewhere around 33 AD. Now, we know for sure that the last book of the gospel, the book of Revelation, is written in Patmos or on the island of Patmos in the early 90s AD. Now, that's a cool 60 years to play with. So what else happened? Well, we know that St. Paul was doing his business in the mid-50s AD. So Jesus dies around 33 AD. St. Paul, less than 20 years later, is right there in the thick of it. We know, remember how St. Paul began. He had the conversion experience on the way to Damascus. He, uh, you know, becomes a great Christian evangelist. He spends some time in Arabia praying. He goes and connects with Peter in Jerusalem. And then he goes out on his evangelical tours, founding churches, establishing the faith all over the place. This is important for us to know because a lot of Protestants nowadays would say that most of the theology that we as Catholics consider our theology doesn't show up until 100 or 200 or three years, 300 years later. But in reality, St. Paul is doing his thing less than 20 years after Jesus died, which seems like a long time for us, but really in the, in the reality of things, the apostles were doing all of their stuff in that time, and so it follows pretty logically that it's about the time frame. The Gospels are written, almost certainly St. Mark gets started in the early 60s AD, uh, and he is, is following along with the work of St. Peter. St. Mark and St. Peter are doing their thing, uh, and St. Mark's gospel is almost certainly written in the city of Rome after St. Peter's you know, entire preaching, and because St. Peter is not there to preach anymore, almost certainly because St. Peter is crucified in Rome, then that becomes St. Mark's call to write the gospel based upon what he understood from the preaching of St. Peter. And so that is the first gospel that's written down probably in the early 60s. Then we know that St. Luke, who was, who was going wrong with St. Paul, and we know that St. Matthew, who was mostly set up shop there in Jerusalem, uh, were, were also writing their gospels or collecting their gospels. And after they see that Mark's gospel is doing its thing, right early, right around 70 AD, which is when the temple is destroyed, both Matthew and Luke write their gospel. So do you have Jesus dying around 33, 34 AD? You have St. Saint Ma- Paul doing his thing in the mid-50s, and then about 10 years after that, in the mid-60s to late 60s, we have Mark, Matthew, and Luke write in their gospel. Then we have the letters, the other Catholic letters of the New Testament, you know, John and, and Timothy and whatnot, being written in that space between a 70 or so AD, when the, for sure the three, first three gospels are written, and then the 30 years later, somewhere around 90 AD, when St. Uh, uh, John is going to write the, his gospel, and he's going to write the, uh, the book of Revelation. And so that's kind of where the framework of the scripture is written. And that's important to remember and important to know because it gives us a sense of context that the last kind of face-to-face person who was connected with Jesus is there 60 years later. He would have been considered a very old man, and yet he had this large community around him that's helpful to understand the book of Revelation. It's not written as this book that's meant to tell us some kind of secrets and tricks. It's meant to explain what's happened in the course of the last 60 years. Now, we should say that in the middle there, and I kind of alluded to it, my big number two date is going to be the time that Peter dies. Now, Peter dies in 67 A.D., almost certainly on June the 29th. He's going to be crucified upside down in the city of Rome, and he is going to kind of be the catalyst for what follows next, because Peter is the appointed leader of the apostles. He is the one who is given the keys to the kingdom. And when Peter is killed, there's a big kind of question mark over everybody's head. Remember, Jesus dies, he rises again, and he promises that none of the people who who are with him will die until they have experienced the kingdom of God. Now Peter dies, and everybody is trying to say, now what does this mean for us? It means we have to figure out a new pope. 
for one. That's a big question. Who's going to be the leader of the group? Is it just the next oldest guy among the apostles? Are we going to cast lots again? How is that going to work? And so that raises a whole slew uh, of big questions about who it is that, or rather how we're going to organize this church that was created on the person of Simon Peter. And so this becomes one of these great moments in history where we as the church have to figure out how to do what the Lord didn't tell us what to do. Jesus didn't write a, a book of law and said, here's the succession plan. We had to figure it out. And we had to ask the Holy Spirit to give us direction. And over the course of the 2,000 years between now and then, we have had to figure out a lot of different things. You know, and we, we, the church will make mistakes. The church will have to correct herself. The church will pass a law and the law doesn't work right or it doesn't do what it's supposed to do or it's misinterpreted or it's willfully misinterpreted. And we have to pull back and say, that wasn't the right way. Let's do this. Let's do that. And we call that whole process organic development. And so St. Peter becomes kind of a, a big, big reminder to us that we don't understand right now every single thing that there is. And that the different, you know, changes in the world around us mean that the church has to respond and the church is going to make mistakes. The church is going to make big, big mistakes from time to time. We're not going to make errors on doctrine, but when it comes to how do we apply that doctrine to the world in which we live, whew, it's a big question mark. Now let's jump ahead a couple hundred years and let's get to probably the most important uh, moment in the ancient church, which is the moment when which Constantine is baptized on his deathbed. Now the emperor Constantine follows Diocletian. He's one of the worst emperors for Christian persecution in world history. And after the, the uh, Diocletian kind of empire is destroyed and Constantine takes over the Tetrarchy and takes over all the, the, uh, the rule of the entire Roman Empire, bringing it back under one man, then he will be converted, he will be baptized on his deathbed, and he will make the rule that the Roman Empire is now a Christian empire. Now this has some positive and it has some negative, event, uh, negative consequences, but it's really worth knowing that in this is, don't worry about the exact date, 337, but in the early to mid, th mid 300s, we have this moment where the, the Christian faith is for the first time going to go from being persecuted to being institutionalized. Now, one of the good things, of course, is that Christians are not going to die every single day. Uh, one of the good things is that the faith now can begin to build the beautiful cathedrals and basilicas. The church now can start to have an effect on culture and start to improve culture. And whereas the Roman Empire was obsessed with the games and the Roman Empire was obsessed with violence and the Roman Empire accepted all sorts of truly horrific uh, perversions of morality, the Roman Empire is going to start to, to move toward this entirely new culture. And while the Roman Empire itself is going to collapse in about 150 years uh, due to some, some big problems coming down the road, the, the Christian faith is going to be ensconced in a way that nobody expected. One of the most amazing things that happens is when Constantine turns off the valve on people being murdered in the street, there becomes this kind of longing within Christians to say, but I wanted to die for the Lord. I wanted to shed my blood for the Lord. And one of the most unexpected consequences is people like Basil and St. Benedict and St. Anthony of Egypt basically say, no, I'm serious. I really wanted to bleed and die for Jesus. That's not possible now. So I'm going to leave the city and set up shop in a cave somewhere and become a martyr, a bloodless martyr, a white martyr is the word we use. And so you have this incredibly unexpected consequence of the persecutions of Christians coming to an end with Constantine and the development of monasticism, the creation of the religious orders. Totally, totally unexpected. Also, when Constantine is doing this, we start to have some real questions about now, what does it mean to say that the Christian church has a role within the larger society, not just a role within our own little religious groups, but now we have this moral obligation to be citizens in the society, to form the society in such a way that it is genuinely uplifting for everybody. Then you have questions too about what about people who don't want to be Christian? 
What about people who are only Christian because of momentum? What about people who are only Christian because mom and dad are Christian? And we start to have whole new questions asked that are still relevant to us today. And, you know, right now, one of the things we're seeing, uh, and, it, and it comes back to the mid-70s, when uh, before Pope Benedict was Pope Benedict, he gave an, a radio interview, and, he, and some people asked him, well, what do you think about the future of the church? And he said, well, the future of the church is not what people expect. He said the future of the church is going to be much more bleak and we're going to lose a lot of people are going to abandon the church because they're only Catholic. They're only Christian because of the momentum they have because their parents were Christian or because society expects them to be Christian. And he said when those people leave, the church will be an entirely different looking thing and she'll be much smaller. She'll lose all of her societal benefits and the only people who will be Christian are the people who actually want to be Christian. And that's a big old giant question mark for us right now because that looks like that's what's happening. But, it, but understanding and going back and thinking about Constantine 300 years into the Christian era makes us ask some questions about what about those people who never once said, I really want to be Christian, but mom and dad are Christian and, and most everybody else is and it's the official religion and so you might as well roll with it. What about those people? The, the, are those people really Christian? Are they Christian enough? What do we mean by that? Let's jump ahead a way, way ahead now. So we looked at when the Gospels were written. We looked at when St. Peter died in 67. We looked at, at Constantine being baptized in 337. Let's jump ahead to the thousands now. Let's go a thousand years into the Christian era. And we have for the entire 10th century, from about 1095 until 1099, and really a little bit earlier than there, um, well, let's, let's just let's tighten up a little. Let's just say at the end of the 10th century, so 1095 to 1099, just th th that chunk, the first crusade happens. Now, the crusades are treated as if they are absolutely the worst thing in the whole wide world by the woke modern world. But we have to remember, it's going back to as early as the 850s, Muslim invaders had come in and taken over and destroyed temples, destroyed churches. Uh, you know, what we're seeing with ISIL and, and ISIS in Libya, we, we saw in the last five years, that wasn't new. The destroying of historical monuments, the destroying of churches, the brutal murder of people who refused to convert to Islam, that's pretty typical. We've seen a lot of that in world history. Well, for about 250 years, that was just kind of the norm. You know, the, the Muslims would come in and the local people would do their best to fight them off, uh, you know, and that was just the way it was. And that was something that, that went on for a good long while. Well, about the, the late 1000s 1090s, 1095, finally Pope, I believe it's Urban II, decides it's time now to do something about this in an organized way. And so he calls the First Crusade together, and he calls knights and warriors from all over Europe. Now remember, we're, we're now in the early Middle Ages. The, the era of, of the Roman Empire is long gone. You're mostly looking at kind of, you have little local kings and princes, and you have little local uh, knights and, and, uh, and, and, um, and serfs and warriors. We're in that kind of era. And so you get this big call and these people show up and they all march to Jerusalem in order to get the Muslims out of Jerusalem. It's not to murder every Muslim you can find, but it's to get rid of these people from, uh, from Europe. And of course, there's, there's not, this isn't just coming out of thin air. The call has come from the Byzantine emperor, where the Roman Empire is actually still alive at this point. It's no longer a Roman Empire. Now it's the Roman Empire of the East, which is centered in what is now, uh, what was then Constantinople, which is now uh, Istanbul, Turkey. And so the Pope gets all these folks together and they go to try to get rid of the Muslims. This is something that goes on for a long time. There's going to be a number of, of crusades, some good, some bad. But it's worth knowing that right around the time of the first Christian, or the, thou, the end of the first Christian millennium, that this is happening. It's happening right after the Battle of Hastings, which changed warfare in the West forever. We totally rethink 
the way that we do wars. This is only a, a you know, bit after that, one, two generations after that. This is right after the Great Schism in 1054, where the Eastern Patriarch has excommunicated the Pope, and the Pope has excommunicated the, the East, and now we get the phone call, hi, we just excommunicated each other, and we all still kind of hate each other's guts, but can you come over and bring some knights, and let's just see if we can't get these people out of Jerusalem, because they're destroying these ancient sites in the life of Jesus. The, the idea today now is that this was some kind of race-driven thing, but in reality, it was, it was just a matter of, please stop destroying our history. And, it, and the Christians at the time were very much live and let live. You could be Jewish. You could even be Muslim in Christian cities. Remember, if you were in Spain at the time, this is when the, the Conquesta had happened, before the Reconquesta, and you had the Muslims destroying uh, uh, you know, parts of southern Spain, you could be Muslim in France, or what is now France. You could be a Muslim in Italy, but you absolutely could not be Christian in any kind of Muslim uh, city or place. And so this was definitely one of these kind of fight back, and the, the Catholic Church had turned the other cheek for centuries at this point. And so the, the Crusades are, are grossly misunderstood part of our history, and it's worth knowing that they started almost 400 years after the first Muslim invasions, and after the Muslims had already taken over most of what is now Spain, and after they had also taken over most, if not all, of what is now you know, considered kind of the Middle East, which were Christian places, and had brutally murdered Christians in their thousands by the time that we actually got over there. It's also worth remembering that this was not just, the Crusades weren't just called by a bunch of random popes, but that truly mystical writers, I mean, incredible saints were calling for these crusades as well because they were saying it's time. We have to protect what the Lord has given us. It's ludicrous to let it be destroyed and just watch it be destroyed for no good reason. After all, these people don't believe in Christianity and they are specifically, their mission is to destroy Christianity and to destroy Judaism. And y'all, if you don't think that's the case now, you're deluding yourselves. That's the stated mission of an awful lot of folks over there in the ISIL and the ISIS groups. So we've done, we've done four. We're about halfway there now. We've got the Gospels and, uh, are written in the, in the 60s, 70s. St. Peter dies in 67. Constantine in 337. We have the Crusade, First Crusade, right around, the, right before 1100 A.D. Let's step into what is two great events in the 16th century we're jumping way far ahead now. Let's talk first about Our Lady of Guadalupe. 1531, this is December. December the 9th, uh, the young man Juan Diego, who is probably a fairly educated guy, he is walking from the big city um, uh, of, of uh, Tepe, uh, uh, the big city of, of what is now Mexico City, and he is walking past this hill at Tepeyac, and he sees this woman who is standing on the hill. He does not know she is the Blessed Virgin Mary. He sees her standing on the hill, and he strolls up there because these are not busy people. He's not wearing a watch. Nothing has changed in Mexico since then. He's just kind of strolling along, and he goes up, and he says, hey, what you doing? It's cold. And she says, listen, I want a church built here, and I want you to be in charge of it. And many of you know the story from that point on. Juan Diego believes the woman. He goes to see the bishop. The bishop says, no, that's not going to happen. Juan Diego comes back. She says, no, no, try again. He's faithful. He comes back again. The bishop says, no. But, he, but the bishop says, if you want me to do this, you're going to need to perform some kind of miracle. So it is that Juan Diego goes to the woman, and she puts a bunch of these flowers into his little, uh, you know, his, his uh, tilma, and he goes back with this huge pile of roses. This is December. There are not hot houses. There is not a, you know, a specialty florist you can visit in, in Mexico at this time. And he comes back with all these flowers. He pours them out in front of the bishop, and there, miraculously, on his tilma, is this image that we now refer to as Our Lady of Guadalupe. Perhaps the most important thing about this devotion, though, is that Our Lady does not appear to be a Middle Eastern woman. She does not appear to be a slightly overweight Belgian woman, uh, you know, as you'll see in a lot of paintings. She does not appear to be white. She does not appear to be uh, you very much, like I said, Middle Eastern or to be European. 
she appears to be a woman native to that area. That's astounding because it has this strong sense that the Lord is here. The Lord wants people to know he's here. Now, there are two other side effects about this which are fascinating. One, this happens only a handful of years after Martin Luther nails the 99 theses on the, on the door in Worms and begins the Protestant revolt, which is the greatest heresy in the history of the world, which destroys Christianity in Europe. And while we have about 9 million Christians leaving Orthodox Christianity and embracing the Protestant heresy in Europe, here in the New World, we have about 14 million new Catholics who go from being pagans in, and, and becoming very, very faithful Catholics. And it's one of these astounding moments for, for another reason as well. Not only is Our Lady native to the area, not only is, is this following up on the destruction of Orthodox Christianity in Europe, we also have this sense that Our Lady is playing an active role in the modern church. That she is not just the queen mother, you know, who did her thing and then who shows up in Revelation chapter 12, but she's actually playing a role in the history of the world. And this is going to become a much, much bigger deal in our time. But we start to get this sense that the Lord has something very, very important to do with us and that Our Lady is going to be playing a gigantic role in it. Now that's the beginning of the 16th century, 1531. The other big event also associated with Our Lady comes toward the end of the 16th century. This is 1571, and this is October 7th, the Battle at Lepanto. The Christian Crusades began because of Muslim invasions going back to the 700s AD, the, or the mid-700s AD. The First Crusade begins a little before 1100 A.D. In 1571, we have the last great Muslim incursion into Europe before our own day with this refugee crisis. And so in 1571, you have a battle with which the Muslims are supposed to win. They show up in the Bay of Lepanto. They've got more boats. They've got better boats. They've got better sailors. They're all lined up and ready to do. We have kind of the last ditch effort. You know, this is the Battle of the Line. It's the last folks we have. And there's, there's the prince, uh, Prince John, who is looking out at this army and he's saying, we can't win. And so he begins to pray. The Pope shows up. He begins to pray. And everybody basically says, if we lose this battle, the Muslims are going to we're going to spend another 500 years trying to get the Muslims out of Europe. And so the battle begins. It's going badly for the Christians. Finally, in the middle of, of just unexpected everything, the winds change dramatically, and suddenly the far superior army of the Muslims is destroyed by the far inferior army of the Christian coalition, what's called the Holy League. And so you have this moment where really it's, it's the Lord that does this, or it's Our Lady that does this. And a lot of people report seeing an image of Our Lady in the sky. We have, at this point, the first time that Our Lady of the Rosary is invoked. This is Our Lady of Victory or Our Lady of the Rosary. And so in the 16th century, we have this game changer where now Mary is playing an active role in the history of the world. And in, in a very, very real way, both these cases, uh, whether it's against the, the, uh, the, the Mexican you know, kind of pagan, pagans in Mexico, or whether we're talking about the Muslim invasion, we have Our Lady being the one who is responsible for a large number of conversions to the faith. That's going to become a much bigger deal uh, when we get up to number eight, Our Lady of Fatima, where Our Lady basically says you need to look for the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's what we're waiting for in our modern world. So we have now, just walking back through our first six, we have the Gospels written in the 60s and 70s. We have St. Peter dying in 67 AD, June 29th. We have Constantine baptized May the 22nd, 337. We have the First Crusade around 1100 AD. We have Our Lady of Guadalupe in 1531. And we have the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. Let's turn our attention to another Marian day, which I think is hugely important. This is February 1858. Now we're coming pretty close to our own day and age right now. This is 1858, and Our Lady appears to St. Bernadette Subaru at Lourdes. Lourdes is one of these places that, that 
is so, so important, but not for the reason that people tend to associate with it. Our Lady appearing at Lourdes opened up, or rather closed, one of the most difficult theological questions in the history of the church. Is Our Lady the Immaculate Conception? Was she conceived without sin by the way that our Lord Jesus, when he died on the cross, applied the grace of that resurrection retroactively into history so that she could be saved from receiving original sin before, at least in terms of history and lineage, in, before Jesus had actually died on the cross. Is that even possible? St. Thomas Aquinas said, no, it's not true. It's not the way it works. She is not the Immaculate Conception. The question is, is spinning all over Europe, and in 1854, the question has been hammered down, and the church says she is the Immaculate Conception. That's the case. It's the truth. We believe this. It is infallible, dogmatic, from the chair, ex cathedra, teaching. Our Lady is the Immaculate Conception. 1858, four years later, there is a little girl, uneducated, in a small town of France, and she is out playing, and she sees a woman who is standing in kind of an alcove on a cave of a, of a cave sort of area, and she's standing kind of up on this thing, don't know how she got there, and the little girl plays and looks, and she sees this beautiful woman. Again, not glowing, not the Blessed Virgin Mary, just a pretty woman. And the little girl goes, oh, you're pretty. And the woman goes, go and tell the bishop, I am the Immaculate Conception. Now, this is long before the, the level of catechism where we're saying, you know, here are the names of these feast days, you should memorize them. This girl has no idea what La Conception Immaculée means. She has no concept of what, she's never even heard the words spoken. She goes to the bishop, she says this, the bishop freaks out. He has no way, she, this little girl has no way to know this, and from that moment, the waters of Lourdes begin to have healing properties. And since then, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people go to Lourdes every year, and there is a huge devotional life there, long lines for confession, and it's one of those incredibly blessed places to go. I've been there myself. It's lovely. It's, it's a little bit overdone, and it kind of you have to walk kind of past uh, the Las Vegas of religious gift shops to get to the actual uh, church itself. Uh, and you need, I mean, you need professional climbing equipment, I think, to get all the way from the ground up to the top church. It's a, it's a stop for a breather kind of thing, unless you're in pretty good shape. But Lourdes is a remarkable thing, not just because of the healing properties. It's remarkable because it now makes incredibly clear that Our Lady is going to be playing an increasingly specific role in the development of faith in the modern world, and in particular in Europe. And so now we have Our Lady who has appeared at Guadalupe, she has appeared outside of Italy in Lepanto, and now she has appeared in France, just at the moment that France is starting to lose its faith, just at the moment where France is starting to lose connection with its Catholic heritage, there's Our Lady again. And she's starting to have a theme. She starts to say, you need to do, you need to do penance and pray the rosary. Now the reason this matters, 1858, is, be, is essentially the big deal is because of the Immaculate Conception. Here is Our Lady saying, the church got it right, listen to the church, I am the Immaculate Conception, pray the rosary, do penance. Now, I would argue, and I think some people could argue with me, that La Salette is another important place where Our Lady shows up, but if we're going to have one more date where Our Lady really, really matters, and I think we really need to, it's going to be arguably the single most important date in modern church history, which is going to be May 1917, the appearance of Our Lady of Fatima. This is the easily, easily the single most important mystical event in the modern world. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, more important than Guadalupe, more important than Lourdes. Uh, you know, this is, this is the single most important event, very possibly since the, the death and resurrection of Jesus in terms of the history of the church and in terms of the way this affects the way that we think about the history of the church. It's certainly on par with the death of Peter. It's certainly on par with the choosing of the new pope. It's certainly on par with these essential moments in world history. 
Our Lady of Fatima shows up on the scene. She works a great miracle on October the 13th, 1917, and she basically contextualizes the complete chaos of the modern world, understanding World War I, understanding what's coming with World War II and nuclear energy and the capacity we have to destroy ourselves. Also bringing forth the miracle of the sun, the largest single miracle ever experienced in world history in our own age, 1917. It's easily the most important event, I mean, in, in, in our modern world. It's hugely important spiritually, and it really hammers home two things. One, it tells us Our Lady is playing an important part, and if you don't have a way to be connected with Our Lady, you've got troubles. Okay, you need to pray the rosary every day because Our Lady has said this is the big deal. And this whole idea that penance matters is really being hammered home. The other big thing it does, though, is it establishes this idea of the, the errors of Russia. The idea that communism is the great threat, far above and beyond the, the threat that we claim it is. That the errors of Russia, specifically the whole notion of the kind of distributist mo notion of, of understanding economy, materialism, as well as the, the, uh, the, the errors of Russia, more broadly speaking, with its, its you know, treating people as property sort of thing. Our Lady Fatima has so much to say to us. She reveals to the kids purgatory. She reveals to the kids redemptive suffering. She re reveals to the kids the idea that her immaculate heart will triumph. That, that the world is not just going to come to a screeching end and Jesus is going to start separating sheep from goats, but that before that happens, absolutely before that happens, her immaculate heart will triumph in the world. And so it changes in a very real way our entire perspective on what it means to be modern Christians because what we're looking to do here is to assist in bringing about the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That does not mean that we're paying any less attention to Jesus Christ, not at all, but it does change everything about our perspective in terms of what the role of the mystical is, what the role of the supernatural is, and hey look, you know, 50 years after Our Lady says this, we see the complete implosion of Catholicism. I mean, from the 1960s until now, Catholicism jumped off a cliff and has been dying in the West. And not a little dying, I mean dying, dying. Even right now, for every one Catholic in the United States who becomes Catholic, nine leave, either by leaving the church or by dying. We have jumped off a cliff. The church is dying. And the only two places where life is happening in the Catholic Church in the United States and in Europe is in the charismatic renewal and in the traditionalist groups. It's one of these remarkable things. And both of those groups are deeply attached to the Blessed Virgin Mary. But middle-of-the-road Catholicism tends to want to say, no, let's not talk about the devotional things. We don't want to press the rosary on people. We don't want to press devotion to the Immaculate Heart on people. We don't want to press the first Saturdays. And yet those groups that are absolutely gung-ho for that are your charismatic and your traditional types. And the same thing is happening in Europe, where the church is just, the implosion is further along. And where the church is growing is in Africa, in India, and in persecuted places like China. And there, where the church is growing, those people are obsessed with the Immaculate Heart of Mary, First Saturdays, the Rosary, and penance, fasting, real fasting. And so it's remarkable to me that Our Lady shows up on the scene, and then she begins to explain to us the two things we need is penance and the rosary, and the groups that have really embraced that are the groups that are thriving in the world, and the groups and the, and the, the kind of the broad, broad middle of the road church that has not embraced that has been in decline. Now, this is not a matter of me making some kind of rash judgment. It's a matter of saying history shows us how we are to understand our own error, era. And that's the world in which we live. I mean, all, you know, the, the reason we study history in school is to get to this point, to understand our own thinking and our own world because we understand what other people have understood about themselves and their own history.
Let's do two more quick ones that both happen kind of right on top of each other uh, and that I think are, are very, very important. I think Dr. Moxer makes a really good point about. May 13th, the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, 1981. 1981. So this is, you know, about, what is that, about, about 30 years ago. Uh, Our, Our Lady of Fatima's feast day, Pope John Paul II, who's only been Pope for a couple years, he is, his, he is very Marian, he is very, very devoted to Our Lady. Both his crest and his motto are very, very much the Blessed Virgin Mary. And on the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, he is driving along in the Pope Mobile, and a Muslim guy comes up and shoots him. The story of Pope John Paul II's attempted uh, assassination is bonkers. I mean, crazy nuts. He's picked up in a hospital, or he's picked up in, a, in, a, in a, 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 um, an ambulance. He goes driving right past the hospital where he should have gone to, where they had his blood stocked, where they had his special suite ready and all this kind of stuff. He blasts past that, and they drive all the way across the crowded city of Rome and almost lose the man two or three times to a hospital all the way on the other side of town, and there they give him blood that is tainted. He almost dies from blood poisoning. Uh, the doctors are inept. Uh, there's, it's just, the story is bonkers. But it happens on the feast of Our Lady of Fatima. And we, we discover, come to discover that there are some, some, some secrets associated with Fatima where Our Lady gave the children three secrets. There's a big question about whether the third secret was released properly. There's a big question about the third secret, including the effort to assassinate a pope. Um, and so on the Feast of Our Lady of, of Fatima, we have Pope St. John Paul II, who is shot in his cassock, and you have all this kind of stuff where it almost feels like a conspiracy to see him not treated properly from the wound. And of course, the cameras themselves in, in, the, in the square, everything is chaos. And then suddenly, and out of nowhere, someone manages to find an image of Our Lady of Fatima and puts it in the chair the Pope would have sat in to, gave his, to give his speech. The event is it fulfilling a prophecy that was kind of beyond expectation, kind of beyond the sense of any of us could get our heads around. And so we have this moment where, again, Our Lady is the actor of this modern era. Finally, the tenth one, and, and Dr. Moksar and I will, will agree and disagree about some stuff, but let's look at 1989. 1989, we are now at the end of the 20th century. Things, the 20th century is one of the worst centuries in world history for a lot of different reasons. And there you have the, the Soviet bloc, which has taken over you know, pretty much all of, of that part of the world, all of Russia and, and Central Europe and Poland. And, and it's, it's, it's really kind of devastated the people. And what is this? This is Russia. This is the errors of Russia. It's communism. It's fascism. It's truly, truly awful. Pope St. John Paul II is elected from within the context of communist Poland. He is absolutely the last person that the Russians want, uh, and he is, he is the person who is perhaps the least expected. He's very much a Western man and very much an Eastern man. He is elected to the throne on, on, in 1978, uh, I believe at the end of 1978, and he then is shot in, on the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima. He goes back to his own country, Poland, several times, and then out of nowhere, and, and with very, very little reporting, he begins to encourage a movement called Solidarnik, which is solidarity in English. And this is a group of people who are fighting communism in the most unexpected ways, through prayer, nonviolence, and the arts and art, you know, I mean, it, through, through acting and music and poetry. And Pope St. John Paul II, who is vigorously encouraging this group, both through back channels and through front, front channels, manages to, th these people manage to find a way to oust the communist government of Poland without firing a single shot. And it turns out that this kind of movement has a, a deep spiritual, you know, kind of ripple effect. And in 1989, August and December, communism falls in Poland. And then on Christmas Day, communism falls in Russia. And I mean, no one can provide an adequate explanation without simply saying that our Lord kind of got involved here. Now, what's amazing is the days that communism falls are all Marian feast days. 
And so this whole story of this modern era could in a certain way be the role of Mary in our modern day. And so what I would encourage you to do is not just to, to listen to this once and go woohoo, but take these dates and think about them and, and start doing some reading. And when you think about reading history, don't just think about doing it for the purpose of memorizing dates and names, but think about it for the understanding of this is the way that people thought. This is the way that people understood themselves and the church and the world. So just as a, as a recap, now my first one, that or I should say Dr. Moxer's first one is the Gospels are written between 60 and 70 A.D. St. Peter dies in Rome on the, the June the 29th, 67 A.D. Constantine is baptized in Rome on, in May of 337 A.D. Just before 1100 A.D., the First Crusade begins. Our Lady appears at Guadalupe in 1531, December. The Battle of Lepanto, October the 7th, 1571. February the 11th, 1858, Our Lady appears for the first time in Lourdes. May through October 1917, Our Lady of Fatima. May 13th, 1981, John Paul II is shot in Rome. And then August and December 1989, basically every Marian feast day within that window, you have the fall of communism in some place, in some way. It's a remarkable moment where we can start to see that our Lord has been planning these sorts of things for a long time. And since the 1530s, Our Lady has clearly been the one who has been, who, or the, the one who is appointed by the Lord to be increasingly the face of what the Lord wants to do at this moment in history. And we could actually make an argument that it goes back to the Crusades uh, associated with, with the saints who were, uh, who were pushing the Crusades for any number of reasons, uh, including St. Bernard of Clairvaux, but we'll put that off for uh, another more complicated discussion. And so I certainly want to encourage you to think about history in these, uh, through this lens and to ask the Lord, what is he saying to us through the way that history has played itself out? There's a lot more dates that could be included with something like this, but I want to encourage you to think about this and encourage you to read history on your own, not just for the purpose of some academic pursuit, but to understand how people think and to understand what they believe and to understand what that can teach us, not just about the past and not just about our present, but even about our future and what we can expect the world to do. And as we have some free time during this quarantine, I hope that you take up advantage of that and I hope that you make use of it. As always, if you have any questions or suggestions for topics for discussion, please contact me on social media and I will be happy to entertain them and see what I can do. And I do hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. God reward you. Bye-bye.